Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Disruptors. Today, we've got Ricky Gutierrez, a big time influencer in the Phoenix market. And he's going to share how he grew his YouTube audience to almost 1 million subscribers, as well as building the largest investment investment Facebook group at over 300,000 yep. people in the group. Um, if this is your first time tuning in, I am Steve Trang, sales trainer to some of the top investors in the country. And I'm on a mission to create 100 millionaires. Uh, today, if you guys get value out of this show, please tag a friend below or share this episode right now. That way we can all grow together um, and just, well, we'll just jump right into it. Yeah, let's do it. So um, you're still pretty young, right? 26, yeah. 26, <laughs> and I see, you know, your stories and, you know, like one, one of the youngest millionaires in Arizona, uh, but obviously you didn't start off as a millionaire. Of course not. So let's talk about your journey. What was your first step into entrepreneurship? Yeah, so just like anyone else, uh, I, I was always fascinated with the idea of like buying and reselling things. So I bought and resold everything from uh, headphones online. That was like one of my like, um, really, I, I just remember looking back in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember buying headphones online, trying to resell them on eBay. That was the most popular platform there. Uh, buying and reselling phones, and then it transitioned into buying and selling cars, and then you know, uh, now we are where we are today. But um, so let's start with headphones. Yeah, that was the first thing. Yeah. Okay. So where were you sourcing headphones in uh, high school? Through AliExpress. So okay. uh, on eBay, I was actually my cousin and I became like eBay super sellers. So even back then, uh, I you were a super seller in high school. Correct, but uh, so let me explain it. Um, I don't know how eBay works now. Uh -huh. I know Amazon's like top notch, right? Right. Uh, but back then it was eBay, and one of the things that we we got to the point of where when you open a new eBay account back then, you would have to wait like 21 days before they would disperse your payment mm -hmm. uh, after you sell something. Uh, we became so popular or just we got enough positive feedback through our online store uh, that we began buying and you know selling uh, not in bulk it still wasn't anything crazy uh, but w once you got over like I want to say like 500 uh, reviews or something like that uh, you didn't have to wait for the disbursement so this really allowed us to be able to utilize the capital that we had uh, mm -hmm. instead of waiting 21 days and just buying these packages and they're like no branded headphones uh, which then we ended up selling for you know relatively smaller margins they would either and then the, the market got so saturated that it just yeah. wasn't worth it but I there's just so many things but let's, I, I just want to just jump in the headphones it's just interesting yeah. I've never heard anyone talk about flipping headphones what were you buying these for in bulk or yeah. like, so what was it like per headphone? So it originally started at under $10. So $7 and 50 cents per unit, right? So okay. you'd buy them in bulk. So around 50 units at a time. Uh, and then as we began to sell a lot more at a time, my first order I think was 20. Uh, and then we got to 50 and then we went to hundred. But then the headphones began because the market became so saturated, the headphones became, the quality was worse as time went on, which you wouldn't really think, but mm -hmm. it's because so many other manufacturers began to try to jump on the trend uh, and the prices went up as well. So the price for the headphones, we then had to pay 27, you know, $35 per headphone, which we used to pay less than $10, but it was a very fun phase where- But you're, you're so you're buying them for 750 <laughs> yep. approximately. What were you selling them for? Over a hundred dollars originally. On eBay? On eBay, correct. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. you're in high school. Yep. I mean, this is, Pretty good money. I mean, how much were you making a month? Doing it with my cousin. So my cousin uh, was one year older than me and he worked at an electronics store. Uh, so they had th the same idea where they would buy no branded headphones and then sell it um, you know, in the store. So then he was like, hey, I think it'd be a really good idea for us to do the same, but let's just try to do it online. Mm -hmm. uh, so after the ref splits, we were making uh, even think net was around three thousand dollars after expenses and that's not each so we would split it uh down down the line and it lasted about i want to say like eight to nine months before it became so saturated so we're in the very i was in the phase when i was buying and reselling uh the ubid phase i don't mm. know if you've ever heard yeah, of that website yeah. yeah it was a super popular <laughs> back then and as that website was up and coming those were the websites that we were always you know, as AliExpress became a little bit more expensive, we then tried to look for alternatives. We tried to transition to like televisions, but it yeah. just was never the same after that. Um, what were you doing with this money? Because that's a lot of money in high school. Saving everything. You were just saving it. Saving you everything. You weren't splurging it. No. Um, in, in high school, by the time I graduated, uh, one of the things that I love to talk about is I personally came from a nine to five background. I worked uh, in telecommunication sales. So I worked for T-Mobile. Uh, it provided me with a very stable income. I was making over 60K 
my first year. Mm -hmm. um, and ever since then, up until my last job, which when I moved from California to Arizona, I began working for Verizon. This is while I was a full-time student at ASU. And I just love the idea of stability and if you work twice as hard, so if you have your side hustles, I was trading, I was trying to invest in real estate. Um, it just encourages, I think, people that you don't have to try to like rush into trying to make the most money right now because you need to depend on that money. I had my stable income, so I was a full-time worker. And then with that stable income, it allowed me, if I invested the time, to learn more about the market, to learn more about real estate. And as time went on and saving money, um, yeah, I bought my first house. I Again, Arizona in 2015, the cost of living was a lot less in comparison to <laughs> yeah. uh, California, but I bought my first house for $172,000 and I still own that house today. You still live in that house? I do not. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you go from flipping headphones to flipping phones. Correct. Uh, I was doing a number of different things. Again, just trying to be proactive. I um, One of the things I've talked about before is I had a little like tech deck company. Uh, they're like little fingerboards. Again, I was into skateboarding back then. Mm -hmm. And a lot of skateboarders that were my age were like literally tech decks, but they're made out of wood. So they're made out of veneer. I started this little company. I you know started a YouTube channel even back then. I think I hit like 3,000 subscribers. Um, and you just make little like intricate little, you know, uh, veneer pieces like little skateboards and tech decks would sell for like ten dollars for the complete kit uh this veneer boards a very popular site back then was called flat face fingerboards mm -hmm. and those would sell for fifty dollars a little piece of wood uh, i would sell mine for twelve dollars sell mine for twenty dollars um and that was one of the hobbies that i had back then i didn't start buying and selling cars until i was 18. my brother uh, who had a car dealership used car dealership at the time uh, was a huge role model for me and a huge mm -hmm. influence and uh, when i turned 18 on my birthday I had a couple dollars saved and he was like, I want to help you flip your first car. And that is um, what led me to now we're one of the youngest people here in Arizona to own and operate a car dealership. Um, and oh, you have a dealership. I have to, uh, I'm the investor for two of them. So we have here uh, one in Mace, Arizona. It's called Carson and More. Two mm -hmm. people that I met through Instagram. Uh, and we opened up a second location in Arkansas, which is uh, Weston Moore. Uh, he's again, an uh, individual that I met through just YouTube and Instagram. And... I, I just loved the hustle that they both had. They were obsessive about buying and selling cars and uh, they were so just eager to open up this dealership and we opened it during the worst time. It was uh, 2020, the start of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> before we get into that, I yeah. wanna ask you, um, you mentioned you went to ASU. Yep. Did you graduate? I did not. Okay, so yeah. how far did you get into it? So my uh, the end of my junior year, so almost going into my senior year. Okay, what was your major? Technological entrepreneurship and management. I pretty much had to start a business. Okay. Yeah. But you already started a business. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so I was I was in class where uh, I've heard that some, one of the uh, at the Polytechnic campus, it's a much smaller campus. Um, one of the professors, his name is Professor Philly, and I heard he still talks and uses me as an example of an like I just remember going into class and sometimes I'd have to be a little late because I was working full time. I was you know uh, doing my channel full time, I had my group full time, and I had a girlfriend at the time. That's a full time job, uh, and then I uh, went to school full time. So yeah. um, he really allowed me to work around my schedule, um, and he just always encouraged me to continue to pursue what it is that I'm doing, and um, it, it's it's really great to like. When there's like so many things against you uh, and the idea of like um, how many things can go wrong. It's just mm. so great to have that like positive reinforcement, like like this podcast, sure. having people that wanting to pursue real estate and having you as a true example of, you know, a positive reinforcement of what can potentially be that outcome. Yeah. Awesome. So, all right. So you, what was the first thing? So you quit, um, you were in college, you're, you're running a YouTube channel full time. Yeah. So describe what that means full time for someone that doesn't that's not a youtube uh that's not a youtuber right what does it mean to have a youtube channel full-time and your full-time back then is different than your full-time today correct yeah so i mean it was full-time back then it is it's does not seem fair for me to say full-time because at the end of the day i upload one video a day uh, back then i used to upload two videos a day so that was considered like an extreme like an extreme full-time mm -hmm. uh youtuber but you have to understand like i don't film vlogs i don't film entertaining content um 
I do screen recordings. I would talk about in the beginning, right, right when the market opens, market opens here in Arizona at 6.30 in the morning. I would talk about, you know, what stocks I'm looking into um, and where my focus is for the day. At the end of the day, when the market closes, as of right now, uh, due to daylight savings, it closes at 1 p.m. So uh, I would then do a recap, talk about my profit or my loss and what I did well, what I could have done better if I made mistakes. Um, and that's really just it. So it, was, it wasn't anything special. It was just I would... I think one of the things that I attribute a lot of my success to is I was literally just attentive to the people that would watch my videos and I would create content based off of their requests. It was nothing like I wake up every morning even now. I don't necessarily know what I'm gonna talk about until I see the feedback that I'm mm -hmm. receiving from our viewers. So what full time being a full-time YouTuber means to me is just uploading consistently or with a schedule, right? Uh, I've talked to you a little bit about it mm -hmm. where, you know, someone like Graham Stefan uploads once every three days, right? But he has a number of channels now, but it didn't start that way. Uh, where like myself, it's one video every single day. Uh, we see people sometimes upload, you know, once a month, once a week, so. Or some people uploading m many times a day. M yeah, me, Kevin. Me, yeah. Kevin's a great example and he's absolutely killing it. So right. um, one of the things is like, I began uploading on YouTube consistently, not because I didn't, even now, I don't even get that many views. Back then I got even less views. Um, it wasn't because I wanted to be a YouTuber. I never thought that I would have 976,000 mm -hmm. subscribers. Um, I literally just, I loved the idea that I could be of value to other people. Uh, and I became obsessive of that where um, our free Facebook group, our free Discord group, everything that I had was just like, I wanted to be of value for others. I wanted, you know, if people were making similar mistakes to me of like, you know, what I did differently to maybe, you know, manage my risk a little bit better. Yeah. And those little simple things I found out added, um, you know, a lot of value to their core foundation of which they can eventually build off of, so. So let me ask you this, this attentive, to your audience. Cause I think that's something that everyone's like, how do I come up with content? How do I come up with Literally, content? Yeah. Right. And that's a struggle for a lot of people. And I think what you said is just a really common sense answer. Literally. It's the simple things in life that people tend to overcomplicate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I just had it easy on YouTube. I maybe started at a really good time. Um, and obviously the, all, all those videos are not ones that do extremely, extremely well. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're a value and they're a value to- But they're your core audience. They're our core audience and at the end of the day, that's the audience that I, I really wanna attribute my videos to. So how do you, how are you attentive? What, what, what actions or steps are you taking to uh, be attentive? I trade live every day. I'm one of the only people that trade live every day. I work with them every day. I you know, respond to messages every day to this either private group, I have a free group as well, free Facebook, free Discord, and to the best of my ability, obviously we, you know, uh, miss a few just with the hundreds of messages we get a day. Uh, but I just try to be there every single day. Uh, I know that, um, and again, I miss videos from time to time, mm -hmm. you know, um, as in, you know, life gets in the way. But I try to the best of my ability to be there every single day. If it's a video about real estate, that's normally what I upload on the weekends. If it's a video about reselling my you know, cars, I mm -hmm. recently just flipped my Ferrari for a day. I made $14,000 profit after eight months. Um, anything in a way that I can talk about how I did, what I did, if it was good, if it was a mistake, um, I just try to be there consistently because you know I'm, I'm never here to say that I'm the best. I'm never here to say that I make the most money, but I feel like I can outwork and outperform a lot of people. Tactically though, how do you, like, are you constantly reading the comments? Are you looking at the DMs? What what are you referencing? Comments I use more as like a reference um, just because it's it's an abundance of, of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's more about the people that message me on Instagram, uh, more of the people that direct message me on Discord. Um, I engage with them in the main chat, so it's just the common chat room. Mm -hmm. um, and if I see a question being requested or being asked multiple times, then I, take a note and I make sure that I create a follow-up video uh, for it. So there's, you know, notes that I've taken this week that, you know, over this weekend, I recently made a transition to a new trading platform. People continue to ask me, how do I set up that platform? Mm. And it's kind of common sense. I'm going to, you know, follow up with it. And create a video about it. On Saturday and create a video about it. It's so, that simple. So you're so you're doing a live stream in the mornings when the market Private opens. Private live stream. Yep. Private live stream Correct. when the market opens. Private live stream when the market closes. 
not anymore. So that no, that was on YouTube. I would create every, everything was just on YouTube back then, where I would make a video oh, when so the market opens. Then. Yeah, and then I'd make a video uh, when the market closes. Now I have a private video every mm-hmm. morning at market open when the market opens. I trade live with my LPP group, and then I create a public video depending on you know if it's a topic, if it's you know something's trending, or you know if there's a common question, then I will create that video anywhere from you know nine in the morning to one p.m. I'll upload just one video that day. Okay, so right now, how many videos are are you uploading? a week seven. Oh, one video a day one yeah. video every one time. one public video a day okay yeah all right and then is there anything else you want to share because you know a lot of people looking at one million is an outrageous number of subscribers and you're not quite there yet, but you're just right you're right around the corner yeah right and i mean we have other influencers that i'm friends with that we're struggling to get to you know either hundred thousand or to get to two hundred thousand whatever like what else what other tips would you give to somebody that's a an aspiring youtuber I think one of the things that I mean, it, it's definitely a roller coaster. We've had months where we grow at you know two to three thousand subscribers a day, right? We've had months where uh, we grow five to ten thousand subscribers a month, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's the ups, there's there's the downs. I never started YouTube for the money. I never started it for the attention. I started it because I enjoyed what it is that it did, and it's a very simple task. It's it's kind of like. Uh, people love to ask like how is it that I still trade live every day how is it that like I stay so committed it's kind of just like I need to eat every day right it's, mm-hmm. it's not that I, I possibly want to or it's that I should it's that I I do it's part of my day-to-day task it's that I don't consider myself to have a productive day if that's all I do within the day uh, and obviously there's days um, you know that there's not much I have, I have a great team as of right now and they uphold a lot of that work um, but one of the things that I like look back now versus you know when I first got started is um, I did everything back then and now it really allows me to focus my time and attention in the areas that um, I'm now starting to try to grow so my biggest recommendation for everyone that's just wanting to get started is the idea of do it for the right reason as in like do it because you enjoy it because at the end of the day uh, everything has its ups and its downs and if the monetization is the sole reason on why you're starting something, you are more likely to fail when that instant gratification is not there. Gotcha. So what does y- your activities, right? Because you got your team to support you. So Correct. what is your focus right now, your main activities? My main focus, my main attention as of right now um, is the HQ. So I bought a commercial building in Chandler. Um, and Nice. The, Congratulations. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. So uh, this building I bought, in a way for us to be able to like give back to our Learn Plan Profit members. So mm-hmm. it's going to be kind of like a WeWork for mm-hmm. local traders and exclusive just to our team. So the idea is I have d- these dark trading rooms. Uh, we set up monitors. We set up a dual monitor set up for every individual. And you just come on in, dock up your computer, and you can trade among other people. There's nothing else like it uh, other than you know you being able to trade in Wall Street. There's no common workspace. Uh, and now all I want to focus on is being able to create environments that were not available when I first got started. So that's a big focus of mine. But again, that's I have awesome. a great team like Justin, uh, Michael, Jake, all, all the guys that are uh, part of our team, um, all make it just a lot easier and a lot more enjoyable. Uh, being able to surround yourself you know, uh, with that like positive work environment, kind of like that incubator effect. I know mm-hmm. when I'm down, and I'm surrounding myself around a good group of guys, they uplift me, right? Yeah. And that's the same environment that we want to provide within our you know, uh, HQ. Uh, anytime that you're up or that you're down, to be able to be that, like, create that incubator effect where we're there to uplift you during your lowest points. So that's a big focus. And then I'm just trying to get at your level, Steve, with the house <laughs> flipping. Yeah, um, I'm tr- I'm, we're learning more about flipping houses. Uh, yeah. We started a new project uh, this week. Uh, one of my uh, direct partners is Nick Paladino. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm sure I think you've probably heard of him. Absolutely. And uh, Colby, uh, which is one of your guys' agents. He's mm-hmm. uh, one of my partners for the Paradise Valley Flip. Um, but we started a new project this week. That one was in Goodyear, Arizona. Um, I actually found that property through a follower. So um, nice. I, 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 it's it's so crazy that the world that we live in today that we can find deals like that. The second house that we close on um, or the next house that we close on on Tuesday, uh, that was also through a mutual follower. And um, that one's in Chandler, Arizona. So that one's exciting. And then we check out a new property today for a potential flip. Also mm-hmm. another individual on Instagram. And that one is also in Chandler, but this is like a, a, a condo. Yeah. So this is a little bit different. All right. So I think this is a, a very interesting topic. So um, before we talk about the, the your your followers sending you deals, I want to talk about the car the two car dealerships. Okay, right? It's, I mean, 
we started this show to talk about the um, the power of influence. And the influence has been around forever. Everyone knows the power of influence. But there's different influence today, which is social media influence. Correct. Uh, but it still has the same um, uh, effect. You can connect with people and you can impact yeah. uh, things in, in, in a different uh, way. So talk to me about people reaching out to you about partnering up on a car dealership. So it started with, I'm, I'm big on connections and I'm big with working with people that it's like complementing partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been so blessed to be in a position where almost every, uh, literally every single partnership I've ever established has worked out. Um, these two individuals, I first met Caleb. Uh, I met Caleb, I was actually at Top Golf here in Gilbert and um, I was with our team and Caleb comes up to me and he's like, hey man, I uh, subscribe to your YouTube channel, I uh, love your stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll see you around. So That's, he just recognized you at Recognized me and then messaged me. This is when I had about 100,000 subscribers and he invited me to golf. I'm, you saw, I'm six foot four, I'm super awkward. I'm super <laughs> lanky. Even back then I was even more awkward. I never golfed, I never golfed other than top golf. All right. uh, he took me to an actual golf course and he was like, yeah, let's go. And I just thought it was so different. I was just like, dude, whatever, I, like I'll do it. I was like, it seems exciting. Uh, and we literally just, talked and he was like yeah I buy and sell cars and that was our connection but he did it in a way that I just knew he was so much more well informed and he was so much more obsessive about it where the same thing where my day-to-day -day task consists of trading and uh, that's all I was obsessing about back then he was obsessing about buying and selling cars so how it started was I began to fund his flips mm -hmm. so I think I did it with like ten thousand dollars and he was just an absolute machine. Um, I met Weston through Instagram. He would tag me on Instagram and I would repost them. And this guy just seemed hilarious. He seemed like a good time. So I flew him out from Arkansas, the oh, nice. most random place. Uh, he hung out with our team. He stayed with us for over a weekend and he just resonated so well with our group. Uh, he just got along with everyone and he was like, I love this. He, he came to visit one more time for his birthday. And after that second visit, I asked him if he wanted to move in. Uh, we just recently bought another house in Gilbert and it came with a total of eight rooms. And I was like, you can, you know, have one. Yeah. And he was going to school, he dropped out. Uh, in a week, he moved out to Arizona. And I would say one year after that, so I started funding his deals very similar to Caleb's. Um, and it was Weston's and Caleb's initiative that motivated me to invest in the dealership. If it was not for them, I would not be where it is that I am today with the dealership. Everything it is that, you know, it's ups and it's downs and it's successes within the first six months of during the worst time ever to start a dealership, they sold over a hundred cars. And wow. for a used car lot, having no experience running a business, going through the idea of, of hiring people, a mechanic, being able to service cars, offer warranty. Um, they were working seven days a week. They were there every single day. And what I have to say is the thing that I found so attractive about this partnership is again, that I knew that they were so obsessive about this market of mm -hmm. investing and flipping cars, um, that I knew that the monetary reward didn't have to be there in the very beginning. And that's what I thought was most important. They enjoyed yeah. the process so much. Well, you're investing in them, not the dealership. 100%. Yeah, and uh, I think that's, you know, people look at me like, Steve, how do you have so many businesses? And like, how, when you sleep, it's like, really, I just have amazing people that I trust and empower. Right? Exactly. And if I have people that I trust and empower and support them, then everything's gonna be fine, yep. right? But if I have to try to run a business with people that I don't trust, that I can't rely on. Correct. Everything's going to be a disaster. Accountability, right? Yeah. And and making sure that you uphold your responsibilities. So um, even today, I woke up with a message. It sounds kind of funny, but um, Weston just messaged me, and he was uh, he's not living with us right now because he moved back to Arkansas to run the Arkansas dealership. Mm -hmm. um, and he messaged me today. He's like, "Hey, bud, hope you kill it today in the market." And it's just like little things like that that it's just like it's just so crazy to like be so well connected with such amazing people that when yeah. I saw that I was just like that's so dope it's just like it's so cool to like just have such good people around you that you know he doesn't know if I'm having a good day or having a bad day and it's just like it, it gives you that it's extra encouragement positive touch. yeah it's just a positive touch to take on the day yeah. so. so I'm gonna change directions just a little bit um, obviously we had this thing recently with Wall Street Bets yeah I'm sure you have your own opinions on it yeah what are your thoughts on that whole <laughs> situation yeah, I mean, I um, actually today uh, or yesterday, AMC, which is like their new main focus. AMC yesterday was the most traded stock 
yesterday in the stock market, which outbeat Tesla and Tesla, and like no one outbeats Tesla. <laughs> um, but it's it's something I've never seen before. Mm-hmm. I can see people are very invested in it. Um, I I have no issue with it if you approach it with a. I mean, at the end of the day, there's so many different ways on how to make money in the market. Um, is it risky? Of course, right? Yeah. There's no question about that. All we ever like to encourage people to do is that's not necessarily something that I personally partake in. I wouldn't hold one of those positions overnight, but I also wouldn't be someone that would wreak the benefit of being up 200% in you know, two weeks. So <laughs> right. you need to understand the, the position that you put yourself in. If you are someone that takes advantage of those kind of opportunities, just understand that they come at a greater form of risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and all we ever like to encourage people to do is to approach it with a plan. Do it with a, a, to- like a tolerable position size. Don't do it with with all your money that if it drops 10% that you end up wanting to never do this again. Yeah. It's do it with a dollar amount that you can tolerate, uh, do it effectively with a plan and know when to get out. Uh, I think with a simple approach, like again, with the idea that there's so many different ways on how to make money in any market right now, all the all the altcoins and cryptocurrency, I personally don't do any of those. Mm-hmm. But if you do your part in getting in, getting out, managing your risk, watching your position size, locking in profits, you know, all power, all power to you. Um, I just think where a lot of people are being misled is uh, the idea of like the, and maybe I just don't understand the the movement enough, mm-hmm. uh, but the diamond hands and, and discouraging people uh, and call them paper hands, those that decide to lock in profits. It's like, at the end of the day, do your part to set your future self up for success. Yeah. If that's locking in profits because you, you you just don't see value in this anymore at the current price point, then so be it. No one should ever discourage you to persuade you to change your plan for their own benefit. Right, don't be influenced. Do it for your, your reasons. Correct. Um, yeah, I heard about Wall Street Bets like a year or two ago. And I just like, I was in that subreddit for quite some time and it's very fascinating. Um, the way they speak to each other, I've seen it. <laughs> it's very fascinating and the, you know, YOLO and, Huddle. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. Um, so you mentioned earlier you connected with Graham Stephan. Yep. Uh, who is someone actually, I've, I'm have i in his coaching program. I'm not on the calls anymore, but I'm in his coaching program. I was like, man, one day I'm going to blow up my YouTube. Um, so talk about your experience working with him back in the day, and I don't know if you guys are still involved. Yeah, so I connected with him. He actually sent me an email. Uh, I think he had like 80,000 subscribers. Um, I had about 30,000. Oh. Mm-hmm. And I met up with him for lunch. Uh, we filmed a video on his channel back then. And he was just, he was my first like YouTuber friend um, to, to say the least. And he was just a great guy that, um, it was just crazy to see. He was a little bit older than I was, uh, but he was just a great, very humble person to connect with. And it's been so amazing to see how well he's been able to do. He's, we've talked about it, right? He's completely blown up and I think just because he stayed so true to his character. We've, he's like shared ideas with me of like, oh, maybe I should like, you know, run ad or he just has such a great following that it's like, you, you don't want to mess with that. He has mm-hmm. such an organic flow and it's so amazing. I, I've met him, I've uh, I visited him and his uh, girlfriend and I saw that they just recently moved to Las Vegas. I visited them in, when they're like in Santa Monica and stuff like that. Yep. And it's been great to kind of see the, the progression of his channel of his, the effort he puts into it. You, you like, I've never filmed with anyone that's been so meticulous. About, He's a craftsman. He is, and yeah. rightfully so. I mean, obviously it's working. He runs the largest investing YouTube channel that I know of. Is uh, he? Oh, I didn't know that. He, one of the, if I'm not mistaken, um, and I think he has one of the largest social presence, especially on YouTube Mm -hmm. for like financial advice. Um, And then I met me Kevin through him. So me Kevin was just, um, what is it? Me Kevin, uh, 2021, right? He's running for uh, governor of California. (laughs) He's he's also a guy that I I met through Graham and a great guy that I connected with. Uh, I actually partied with him in Omnia, believe it or not. It's it's funny. (laughs) Um, But just a great group of guys that are just, again, obsessive about what they do. Um, how they do it and just really wanting to be there and to be a value for their followers and just being able to like be connected with those individuals. I think it puts into perspective for me that I, yeah, I think it's great. I'm about to hit a million subscribers, but seeing how much they're growing, how much they're scaling, it just shows you that you're just getting started. Yeah. Well, that's so. my biggest challenge. Cause I, uh, I'm, I'm right here looking at Ryan Pineda who, uh, you met with uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm, 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 looking at him, I'm looking at Kong, 
I'm looking at uh, my other friends, Pace, mm-hmm. Jamil, and like it's always this kind of just kind of measuring where you are. Yeah. As this, and um, uh, what are your thoughts like? Do you think there's a um, does it affect maybe that uh, happiness or whatever? But do you think like it kind of maybe puts um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a damper. Yeah, you know, like because like this idea of like trying to keep up with the Joneses. Like, do you think that happens at all? Or that used to happen to me uh, when I was first getting started. Um, it it doesn't affect me. Like when I passed a million, like it's it's not something that I remember when I passed the hundred thousand. Hmm. That was very. Um, like it felt very fulfilling and stuff like that. When I pass a million, obviously I'm super grateful, uh, but the numbers don't necessarily, it's just the amount of people that have committed to subscribe to my channel. Mm. I know based off of my views and my engagement and stuff like that, I know over 10 million people I'm sure are aware of who it is that I am, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's never been so much about the um, validation from that anymore. Uh, and I just feel like because I've been in this territory for a while that it's not something that will you know the only reason uh we actually talked about it today today i hosted a free live trading session which we tend to do once a month and uh, i took a position based off of my followers request on youtube i gave them three options DraftKings, carvana or at&t three recent stocks that pulled on back uh they said to invest into DraftKings. i put ten thousand dollars and so far i've made uh twenty percent so nearly uh or i think I'm up like 2,300 on it. So mm. 23% for my initial investment. And um, we were like, hey, once I hit a million, a million followers, I'll fly one of you guys out and you guys can stay with us and visit the HQ. And just, you know, the only reason that I'm looking forward to the million subscribers is to be able to do something to then, you know, celebrate, celebrate it. For me yeah. to celebrate a million subscribers by myself or with the team, it's like, we already, we just enjoy what we do so much every single day. We talk about this all the time, and I'm sure you can agree. It's like when you take vacations now, it's not so much because you need like a break from your work. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it so much within myself and within my team that when we come back from vacations, we're just like, dude, finally, like get we got to go work. back to work. And yeah. I think that's that should be everyone's biggest focus is do something or partake in something uh, as a profession or as a career that you don't need a vacation from. That would be my biggest recommendation. It's like obviously you know, the monetary reward is great and it's amazing, but it definitely does not trump the fulfillment you gain from enjoying what it is that you do. Right. Well, I think it's easy for us to say, right? For you and me, right? Because what we do makes a good amount of money. Correct. Um, But, you know, like what if someone like really loves like, um, I don't know, walking dogs or... I did a girl that uh, wanted to be a teacher for kids with special needs and she didn't care about money. Mm -hmm. Um, She didn't care about anything like that. Um, And it was something that, uh, it was actually my first girlfriend and uh, it was something that I found so wholesome and and found so beautiful about a person that like, and I've I've experienced this before in my um, high school uh, journey where uh, there was a teacher, uh, Miss, Miss Fury. uh, And she was just always, she was like the light of my day because of how much compassion and joy she had every single day. Yeah. And you just knew that she loved what it is that she did. So not necessarily start a business that you do what you love, but a career. And, and yeah, love. any profession that you find you would experience fulfillment on. Yeah. I I um I'm big on that. I obviously again it's very easy for us to say because mm-hmm. of the, the monetary reward that we gain from what it is that we do. But I think one of the most amazing things to see is from an individual is I get so pumped when I see someone enjoy what it is that they do. I don't care if it's at a fast food restaurant. I don't care if it's at a, you know, uh, grocery store. If you just, when you just meet that person, that's like the light and you're like at a grocery store, you're checking out and you just see that they're just like, like, oh man, like yeah. super pumped they're up. super nice. Yeah. They it, care about you. Smile. 100%. And it's, and it's just like, it brightens up your day and you're yeah. like, I value that person. And I know that that person values their life. And it's just so amazing to see. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I have a, no, see, before we transition to this, um, what would you say to someone right now that's like, all right, I want to be like Ricky. I want to be a YouTuber, right? Yeah. But they're, they've got some sort of mental block, you know, like no one wants to watch me. Some people are, you know, are introverted, which... Yeah, I get, you know, I, I am. I get the feeling that you are. Um, what do you tell someone like that's putting limiting beliefs on how to get started or on on how to start a YouTube channel? 
again, I think the core foundation of enjoying what it is that you do and then putting your own twist to it. If you look back and you see anyone that's done well in any market, in any market, any business, or even any YouTuber, um, they didn't. They might have done it by copying um, s s some you know, uh, qualities and they cherry picked from other YouTubers. But at the end of the day, every successful YouTuber to some degree uh, has their own twist on how they do things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think character has a lot to do with people's success in any platform. Uh, Ryan Pineda, right? Uh, Graham Stephan, meet Kevin. Uh, even myself, I think one of the things that I attribute a lot of my success to is my character when I was first getting started um, is I was 21 years old. I was 21 years old. I was one of the youngest people doing anything on YouTube in the, in the, in the uh, trading like world, um, and I think that was my edge. That was my character. I was, you know, uh, peppy. I was, I think, easy to relate to, and that was my characteristic that I think a lot of people attach to. Uh, now you see, like, not everyone has to agree with you, but if you can be a value or of entertainment for other individuals, and you do it with your own twist, it's so many people are just so obsessive of copying every step of the way. And I think you can speak from this, like, even in in real estate, to be uber successful or to even maybe potentially one day surpass you is I'm not going to get there by copying you, Steve, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to get there by, I'm sure I can cherry pick the series of qualities that I find very attractive about how you flip houses. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I have to put my own twist to it to be able to get to a point to eventually surpass you. And right. that's what I've understood that in any business is it's great to cherry pick a series of principles in which you can build a foundation on, but don't stop there and don't be afraid to do it in your own way. That can ultimately lead to your success. Yeah, and I want to add a follow-up question to this because I think a lot of people will like, how do I start? It's it's going to suck, well, whatever. So let me ask you this, humbly. How were your first 10 YouTube episodes? Like videos? Yeah. Oh, man. Would you define them as world-class? No, the only reason that they have any views now are because I have nearly a million followers, uh, subscribers and they've yeah. gone back. Um, again, I upload because I, I I used to make car edits. I mean, let's talk about that. So I uploaded my video about how I bought a first my first house at age 20. Mm -hmm. No one cared, right? <laughs> right. I filmed it um, on Thanksgiving Day. I couldn't fly back home to have Thanksgiving with my family because I worked at Verizon. And the next day is Black Friday, which is a really big sales day, mm -hmm. right? So... I made this video with my laptop and then I sat in my dorm room and I was like, yo, I'm closing on December 22nd, 2015 on my first property. No one cared about that. Started making videos about, again, cars, buying and selling cars, looking for my next, uh, for my new daily driver. No one cared about that. Got 50 views. If I got 100 views, I'm just like, dope. I would put edits on it. I would, I would watch Casey Neistat back then. I would try to take his music add them to mine and then I would watch, you know, driving videos and I would try to like transition with my little GoPro. Mm -hmm. They're horrible videos, right? <laughs> but I gained so much fulfillment by making them. Uh, and then I uploaded a couple trading videos and randomly I made like $113 off of a lower cap stock. I did a recap on it and that video blew up and I don't think that video um, was anywhere between my 10 videos. I think it was like uh, in the 50s. Because uh, yeah. again, I just, I was so obsessive about, not a... <laughs> I just enjoyed it so much that I didn't need to do it for the views. Obviously, it added some form of validation and and it only motivated me to do more. Right. Um, but I know that the reason I started it was because I genuinely just wanted to invest my time in doing things that I enjoyed to do. Yeah. So, and the reason I'm asking this question is just want everyone to understand, like, you don't have to be great to start. Yeah. <laughs> but if you start eventually, you will find greatness. 100%. And people love to surround themselves with others that express enjoyment through their work. And mm -hmm. if you can um, create content and express that through your videos, um, I think it's only a matter of time, right? Yep. It's crazy to see the videos that blow up now. And there's so many different platforms and, and ways that you can do so. Yeah, there are. Um, I Again, Ryan Pineda is a, a great example of someone that blew up within a very short period of time during such an unfortunate time, but he took such unfortunate circumstances and made them. And super intentional with it. Yeah. So I have a, a buddy I was talking to actually yesterday, and he's kind of like on this fence. He's like, I've got this business. I can teach people how to do it. Um, but, you know, like I go back and forth on whether I should have an education business or not. Yeah. Right. And I told him like, you're, you're crazy. Like, obviously you have something to share. Like, of course you should, you should definitely go down that route. Yeah. What is something you would want to share to someone like that? That's like, you know, does it make sense to 
you know monetize my audience because I think there has like some people have a negative connotation of behind course. it. But what are your my thoughts, thoughts on it? Are you know YouTube is free, right? Um, Google is free. Your time should never be free. And one of the things is like people love to ask like why would you create a course when there's so many free content, right? Um, why would Steve, someone that does extremely well, want to just you know, you create YouTube videos and yeah, sure, because you want to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it reaches an audience and you do it in a way that's tasteful. But when it's someone that is requesting your time and they want assistance from you, why do you have to be entitled when you receive nothing back? It's all about yeah. uh, there being some form of complementing partnership. And if that complementing partnership is in that sense, it's either like you create something that can be a value for other people. And at the end of the day, as long as you do it in a way that is actually a value, you know, you should never have to convince someone to see value in what it is that they, in, in what you do. And that's something that we've always tried to stay true to where like, you know, I keep my things very simple. I trade live, I do recaps on YouTube, I talk about my green days, my red days, and if you see value in that, great, you can work with me. If mm -hmm. you don't wanna pay for it, then guess what? I upload new videos every single day on YouTube, you're more than welcome to check it out. Do you, am I gonna be of assistance for you or as attentive as I am to my private group? Of course not, how can you request someone's time and feel entitled that mm -hmm. you deserve it when you've done nothing to receive it? Right. Um, and for this individual that's on the fence, it's you can either create something for the people that are already requesting your time mm -hmm. and or they're gonna go somewhere else to find it. Right. So I think that puts into perspective where it's it's very like easy to see that if you have, and I was on the same fence. I had, I think like nearly 100,000 subscribers when I decided to uh, make my LPP course. And I just knew that I wanted to do something differently to be of value. And then that's why I began trading live. So everyone had a course and you know, you can learn off of YouTube and you can. It's mm -hmm. just gonna be a little bit more difficult to learn everything along the way, right? And right. without mistakes being made. But I wanted to provide something that was different and that would be my recommendation for anyone that wants to get into this field. Just make sure that you do something that is, that really stands out. And I think that's something that really surprised a lot of people um, as it provided more value than anyone else at the time. Yeah. Um, and then you've got one of the biggest Facebook groups. Correct. And Anytime someone's got over a hundred thousand, it's already an accomplishment. Um, I think uh, I get these. I hear these guys that own these large groups. They kind of brag to me like, "Hey, you know, like Facebook's looking at my group. I've got a point of contact and this and that, right?" So it is definitely something that's an accomplishment. Yeah, you're at three hundred thousand. Yeah, way past where my other friends are at. How did you accomplish that? YouTube. Um, I created videos. I didn't do it in a way that now I understand marketing. Back then, I was a kid going to school, working at Verizon, and people were requesting to for my time back then. Mm -hmm. And they wanted, they're like, you should create a Facebook group so we can ask you questions. And then from, I was just like, okay. I created a free Facebook group. It, it all, everything that I did was based off of the request. I created so many videos that as I grew on YouTube, it, it organically flowed into my free Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And then people were like, we wanna be able to, you know, people have Discord groups. We wanna be able to direct message you directly. Discord is a more appropriate platform for that. Created a Discord, uh, free Discord for everyone else. And then now we have like over 100,000 on Discord. Mm -hmm. um, and it it wasn't anything special. It wasn't anything that like I, I planned or I prepared for. Is everything that I did was simply based off of our followers requests that then allowed us, now that we understand it a little bit more yeah. on how that is so much of value to have these different, um, you know, touch points for our audience where, yeah. where I can, you know, blast out a message on Discord and tag everyone that is part of our Discord and I can reach 100,000 people. Uh, Facebook group, I can post something and, you know, reach 300,000 people. I can post on YouTube and depending on YouTube's algorithm, they will <laughs> uh, showcase it to, you know, 20,000 yeah. views. So, yeah. So it was a natural byproduct to something you were already doing. Correct. It was an organic flow. It was never something that, uh, like, I didn't run ads to yeah. my Facebook group or anything like that. Um, it just everything, and it's super boring. Uh, I know <laughs> with my story, but everything just happened yeah. like organically and over time. And like I said, I mean, people still view me. Like you asked if I was 23, I know I look super young, uh, but I'm 26 and I started doing this uh, full time when I was 21. It was just because I thought I saw something when I was yeah. looking you up. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's just, I stayed consistent with it. I showed up every day and over you know, a long period of time, now we're, you know, at 300,000. It's the power of consistency as well. Of course. Um, 
tangent here. Um, are you on, I mean, obviously you're on Instagram. Are you on TikTok as well? I am. I just started uploading. I actually, what I was working on when we were prepping for this is I uploaded a TikTok. I'm trying to upload one TikTok at least every day. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get on Ryan Pineda's level. <laughs> I think we all are. Right. Uh, so let's talk about your strategy here then. You know, obviously you already got a team behind you with your uh, YouTube. I imagine supporting your Facebook, supporting, supporting your Discord. Uh, what, what does your organization look like? to help you continue to build this this brand? Yeah, so we have we have great structure when it comes down to our rules. Uh, when it comes down to content creation, I have a guy that's our full-time filmer and editor, amazing. Um, when it comes down to like the messages and stuff like that, on depending on different platforms, I have people that, uh, one individual that assists me with that. And I think as I continue to grow, um, we haven't reached the point where we you know, need to hire someone else. Just if we're a little backed up on messages, I'm a little bit more attentive to it or we'll bring on the different people that maybe have less on their table than mm -hmm. to, to assist with it. But um, altogether, as we continue to grow, our, my biggest focus is just continuing to scale the businesses that we have as of right now um, and to still stay as well connected to our followers, regardless of how big we grow. I think that's the biggest disconnect from a lot of people is it's great when someone's at 10,000 followers on Instagram because they're very accessible, mm -hmm. but once they reach a million, it's very difficult to get in contact with them. I attribute a majority of my success to the people that I've been able to connect with and the business relationships that I've been able to establish. So if I wanna continue to do so, especially with a, with a trading HQ, my goal is to be a value for them, but also any individual that I meet there that I see value in their ideas, I want to make sure that I'm accessible enough that I can be exposed to it, where then I can make the decision to potentially invest in it. Gotcha, that's awesome. Um, and then I heard about you last year through another friend, yep. Templeton. Yep. Um, and so you also fund deals. Yeah, I used to fund a lot of deals back then, yeah. So, so used to, something's changed? Yeah, so now I have my uh, business partner, Nick Palladino, mm -hmm. so um, he, Orchestrates. He's pretty much just the the mastermind behind um, all the house flips we do now. Mm -hmm. So he is as obsessive with real estate yeah. as I am with trading, as Caleb and Weston are with cars. Mm -hmm. And it's again, I'm so fortunate to be in a position where I've been able to connect with someone like that. Yeah. He was part of my LPP group. Uh, he was a model in LA. I met up with him one day, and he came to visit us during COVID for two weeks, and he never moved back. So gotcha. um, now he's purchased three or four properties himself out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is a licensed real estate agent. Mm -hmm. um, he represented me for the HQ that I purchased. So that was, I think he was three days into his uh, real estate license. And that was then, a big transaction for him. Yeah, uh, we, it was a cash offer that we made for a million dollars. So yeah. it was a nice little paycheck for him. And yeah. uh, I think that's what really gave him the push to, he is on the MLS every day. Uh, he comps deals every day. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the reason I don't do hard money loans as much as I did before is because now I'm so much more focused on funding our deals and our mm -hmm. flips as I'm trying to build my own little uh, Steve team. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that happens to a lot of us as entrepreneurs is, you know, we have shiny object syndrome. I don't know if you're guilty of this. I am certainly guilty of it. And so we see things and it's cool. And it's like, oh, you know, we should do this. We should do that. Uh, how do you filter and figure out like this is something I want to jump into or something that I'll just fund it and leave it alone? Can you give me an example? Is this like as a business or is this as a like? Well, so you got the car dealership, correct? Right, and now you're looking at flipping houses, correct? So like, how did you decide like which which businesses to pursue and which ones not to pursue? Yeah, because the other part, like last year, you were just funding the deals, correct? You were so you were putting so money I was hands in the off. You were hands off, but it's because I was shadowing. I was learning, so I was learning from, uh, you know, either mistakes that they made. I I mm -hmm. would try to learn from, you know, if I were to shadow you, I, I would try to cherry pick the series of qualities uh, in your project management and mm -hmm. how you orchestrate your construction, how you comp deals, um, and over a longer period of time, I built this little just understanding of it because I had no understanding, but mm -hmm. I knew. Let, let's be honest, like if I'm just someone with you know 200 subscribers or followers, and I message you, Steve, and I'm like, hey man, I want to learn how to flip, you know, 
houses. It's just like everyone wants to, like yeah. everyone wants to be successful. Like that's not special. But if I approach that, and I think this is where I see a big drawback is when people begin to do well, especially at a young age, they become entitled and they feel like they should never ask questions on how to do something because they feel like they're at a pedestal. For me, it's like, I didn't care. I wanted, I, I found real estate attractive enough, attractive enough where I messaged Lenny Behe, which was a real estate uh, agent and mm -hmm. flipper here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't only want to learn from you, but let me fund your deal so I can be of value for you. And that's where I began to shadow. And at the end of the day, if I, and I think this would be huge, anyone that's watching this that wants to potentially get started in real estate, I think a biggest thing, or the biggest thing, if they're not enrolling in your course, then what is it that they can do to be of value or to shadow? present you a deal, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and if you see that, that would be direct value to you. We're like, I wanna work with this person. Right. Um, same thing with the two people that we just connected with in the past month, the flip that we closed on this week and the flip that we closed on last week, these individuals followed me on Instagram. Mm -hmm. They messaged me, they presented me with a deal, we purchased them. And I can promise you like, I will always take them more serious than any other individual because they were simply of value. Well, they were more proactive. Exactly. Um, yeah. And when it comes down to what businesses that I decide to partake in is our businesses that I s see value in and that I want to pursue. Right now, also a big focus is our apparel. Um, I, again, fortunately was able to connect with someone like Jake who manages our apparel and our apparel started at, you know, uh, it was like drop shipping. We would make like $500 every three months. It was just something that we had on the back burner for those yeah. that wanted to, you know, buy a shirt. We just, you know, had it drop shipped. Uh, now we, customize everything. Every, we work with our manufacturers. We do everything from mouse pads, aluminum arts, uh, flags, hats, shorts, shirts, the shirt that I'm wearing today, it's just, it's a little bit more fitted. And every single time that we have a new shipment, um, you know, design or anything like that, we just try to get a little bit better every single time. And it went from $500 every two to three months. Um, now we're on track for, you know, 2021 to do multiple six figures. So nice. Yeah. So you got this kind of a Kaizen attitude where every day you just try to get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little 100%. bit better. It's, like, yes, I think that's the best way to put it where um, it's hard. It's it's hard to make a lot of progress every single day mm -hmm. within a very long period of time. And I've learned and, and I've heard that it, in the very beginning, yeah, you might make a lot of progress, but then you become stagnant. So now my biggest focus is just, I just, I have simple tasks that I try to take on every day just to get a little bit better. Cause you know, if I do this consistently over a year, uh, there is gonna be a big difference. So what would be some of those tasks that you have to do every single day? So right now, a big focus for the H, right, is, is the HQ. Um, a big focus is trying to, um, when it comes down to uh, flipping houses, I personally wanna understand the idea of comping property. So mm -hmm. the house that we're gonna be walking through today is a house that had a flood. I've never dealt with anything like that. So, you know, I might have to hit up Steve, right, for, yeah. for questions, um, but, either if I'm challenged with these obstacles to try to like learn more to see if it's something that I personally want to partake in, that task alone of just learning if this is a house that I want to invest in and or you know the pros and the cons about it and why I would or why I wouldn't, it's enough of an accomplishment today that I don't need to focus on anything else. I filmed my videos, I did everything else that I have to do, yeah. but that is one simple task that as long as I get that done and I learned a little bit more, I can I, I feel fulfilled, I feel accomplished for the day. That's, that's amazing. What, um when is the HQ open or is the HQ open now? It's gonna, um, so the HQ is open just to us and the people that we invite. Um, I can open it, uh, it can be ready in two weeks. Um, we have so many people requesting to visit um, that I think we're gonna have like a, a closed opening first. So I'm probably gonna invite a handful of people to mm. see, the, the whole idea of the HQ is to be an incubator effect, to be a, a good work environment. If we have 100 plus people in a 7,000 square foot facility, um, I just don't want it to be counterproductive. Sure. So we're probably gonna get 20, 30 people to join us for about two weeks, you know, ask for feedback, how we can make it better, and then go back to the drawing board to try to provide that experience. And then we'll open privately just for our LPP group. And that's, that's something that's exciting. Um, I mean, yeah. I think that's something that, you know, when you guys open, I definitely wanna check that out. Of course, be um, offended if you don't come, Steve. <laughs> what are you excited about right now? Selling this freaking Paradise Valley house flip. <laughs> uh, did you hear about it from Kobe? I've heard about it. Uh, I'm, supposed to, I'm spo still supposed to go check it out with Kobe, but tell me about it. Yeah, so I came, first off, do you know how I met Kobe? Um, I think it was at a night event. No. No? Okay. No. I met him through, he messaged me on Instagram. He was a student at GCU. 
Uh, that's okay. how I first met him. Um, I met up with him at Fired Pie in Gilbert in the Santan Mall. And he had this idea. I met up with him. Um, and I think my business partner, Justin, came with me as well. It wasn't an idea that I want to invest in, but I, I saw that he was motivated. Um, I reconnected with him because Justin ended up reconnected with him on a, a, a partnership or something that they personally established. And then I saw he became a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. He just reached out to me and, and one day then just asked, uh, I started funding a couple like of his flips to, uh, doing hard money loans for him. And Colby is just like, he's a great example of someone that's just so excited to work. He just loves what it is that he does every day yep. and he does it with a smile and it's hard not to, um, he's sometimes too much cause he's too happy, but, um, <laughs> it's, I, I love surrounding myself with people like him because again, he's obsessive about what he does. He presented, he knows exactly me, what he wants. Exactly. Uh, and he presented me this off market listing. Mm -hmm. he, he was like, Hey, re, Hey man, uh, this house is like $2.8 million. And I'm like, dude, I'm just starting to learn how to house flip. Right. <laughs> I was like, I'm funding deals at two to $400,000, like 2.8 million. Like, what are you talking? He's like, he's like, just hear me out. I think we can get it for 2.3 million. Um, I think it will be worth what he said, like 3.5, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how much money has to go into it? And he was like a hundred to $150,000 and I did the quick math. And then we comped it out ourselves and we're like, dude, this is like a good deal. Mm -hmm. Like we saw other properties like being sold for like, you know, three, 4 million and they were much smaller. This one was 8,700 square feet with ridiculous views ridiculous views and um i was like i'm gonna take this step and if i make a mistake and i don't make any money off of it that's fine mm -hmm. but um it it really pushed me to like get out of my comfort zone and i feel like we're set up pretty good for it i, I don't know if it's going to sell for the top dollar asking price that you we're guys asking. are going to crush it with that deal yeah uh, I, I mean, mean when, he, when he showed it to me i was like man like i wish i had the risk tolerance like i know the deal is there yeah I just can't afford to be wrong on this deal. Yeah, so right. that's the thing. It's like if I do take um, a loss on it, it's, it's going to be like a, um, a a tough pill to swallow. But like we say with trading, with starting a business, with anything, it's like even with real estate, don't right. um, try to take on more than you can tolerate. And as of right now, I just I'm so fortunate enough to be in the position where I am today and to be surrounded with the people I am today that I felt comfortable enough to you know take it on. So yeah. I guess hopefully in a couple months I can follow up and share well, my experience. I know for sure you're going to do really well. Yeah. But like I said, you know, I love the upside. I just could not deal with the downside. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, so, but yeah, that's definitely something huge to be excited about. Uh, what is your biggest struggle right now? Biggest struggle? Gaining weight. <laughs> I've been trying to get to the gym. No, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think, um, I can show you how. It's really <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know. I don't really feel like I have, um, there, there's nothing in my life that I'm doing right now that I don't want to do. Okay. Um, everything it is that I do on my day to day, um, I surround myself with people that do well with the companies that we've started. Um, really the only thing that I'm really trying to work on is I'm trying to stay consistent with going to the gym, uh, feeling better, um, trying to look better. And just trying to get, again, being a little bit more well-rounded. Um, and I, I have such a great team for that. Nick, which is my real estate partner, mm -hmm. dude's a freaking model. He shredded. And to see him every day and to go to, to see how, like, just structured he is with his meals and his meal plans and every single day eats the same thing. I've never met anyone like that. I've, I'm a creature of habit, not like that. Yeah. He eats the same thing for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for years. Oh my God. And it's just like, he eats like six eggs, three potatoes. I kid you not, dude. I And you look at him, you're like, what the heck? Three potatoes, turkey bacon, bell peppers, all this stuff. He gets a, it's not a plate. He n does not eat on a plate. He eats on a tub and he puts everything in there. He drowns it with ketchup and then he just consumes it and he eats so fast. And being able to, to have him as an example of like, <laughs> what I could be. It's yeah. just great to be like, yeah, let me try to be a little bit more consistent so I can, I'm not going to get there, but uh, just to feel better about myself. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, so we've talked about a lot of your success along the way. Yep. Were there any failures, you know, interesting, favorite, something you learned really big from? Not with real estate. One of the things that I'm really looking forward to is, and it sounds weird to say, I have not had any failures thus far in real estate. Mm -hmm. And I know it's going to happen. It happens in any market. Uh, so I'm excited to 
make that mistake to really learn from it. We've been so blessed to be in like this bull market mm -hmm. where every house we post for sale sells for above asking price. But outside of real estate, I mean, your yeah. entrepreneurial journey. Correct. Um, trading, of course, trading always has its drawbacks, uh, especially as we transition from 2020 to 2021. We went from a bull market kind of to a nice little bear market, especially with tech and that pullback. Mm -hmm. uh, but nothing that I can't tolerate. Uh, yeah. I was very careful with my position sizes. Um, as of right now, um, this week alone was an amazing week for me. Um, you know, I'm pretty heavily invested in the market. Uh, I have over a million uh, with just one of my accounts. And um, it's been really enjoyable though. I, I really, I love challenges and the, I love how it feels when you come back from failure. Um, yeah. And the only thing right now is our dealerships. Um, two things. On the real estate, one thing that we can work on is we're trying to create structure and being able to bring in more deals without our following more structure to create an actual business out mm -hmm. of it, right? That's one thing that we're working on. Uh, the next thing is on the um, car dealership, how important it is um, to stay profitable consistently, uh, especially with the ups and the downs of just the pandemic and people wanting yeah. to buy cars and how comfortable they are. We have a nice rush when there's a stimulus check. And then shortly after we sell like everyday cars. So, yeah. um, and then there's there's dry spells, but I grew up with my brother owning a used car dealership. So I'm very familiar with it. Uh, I just know I have the right partners for it that anytime there is any uncertainty, uh, they put in the hours to um, you know get us through that rough patch. So yeah. nothing on my table that I'm necessarily too worried about as of right now. Um, is there a book that you've gifted more than any other, read a whole bunch of times? No. There's, no. Yeah, I'm probably the worst person to ask uh, when it comes down to that. Everything it is that I've learned is from experiences mm -hmm. I, uh, or from videos. Um, so I've, yeah, there's not been one book that I've read about real estate. Is there trading. a source you like to learn from? I... Like an, uh, an idol, mentor... Um, real estate, I have to say that I learned a lot from Lenny, right? Um, mm -hmm. I was very motivated by the uh, mentality of Gary Vee, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I was obsessive about when I was first getting started is um, I had nothing to do with trading, but I loved hearing like Elon Musk's story. I love hearing uh, Mar Mark Zuckerberg's story, uh, Warren Buffett. Um, I would fall asleep every single night with my laptop in my dorm room, uh, watching uh, some form of interview of them sharing their story, their successes, their failures, their come ups, um, how they've scaled to their certain point. Uh, Jeff Bezos, all of those. I just, just it, it, it's great to be able to be someone that's doing well, but to know that there's that level so to that success. So much more we could be doing. It's it really humbles you that like you're really still you know a drop in the ocean. So, so the biographies of really successful people. Yeah. Have you watched the series The Men Who Built America? No. Got to watch that. Okay. You'll get fired up. As I mean, there are a lot of things they did were completely horrible. Okay. But I mean, these were the richest men right yeah. in history. What what uh, platform is it on? Uh, I think Amazon. Amazon? Okay. It's either Amazon or Netflix, but definitely it's not hard to find. But okay. I, I mean, when I watch it, and like I was like fired up for like a month. I, and I love those. I absolutely love those. So I'll for sure watch it. Yeah. All right. Um, so think about what what are some last thoughts you want to leave the listeners with? And I'm going to make one just quick announcement. Guys, if you got value today, please like, subscribe, share this. It helps us reach more people. Uh, what are some last thoughts you want to leave the listeners with? Well, the people watching are most likely either people that obviously follow you or that follow me, right? As mm. I after I repost this, and I think one of the biggest things is uh, if you want to do well in any market, make sure that you're a value to the people that you're trying to connect with. If you want them to act as a positive catalyst for your success, right? To be there and to be attentive, you need, there needs to be some form of you know not just give me everything and receive nothing, right? So I, I'm excited for all the people that message you and that want to learn more about real estate investing to see how they approach it. It's not just, I want to learn, everyone wants to learn. I want yeah. to be successful, everyone wants to be successful. Um, what is it that you can do that will be actually be a value and how will they articulate that through that message? So um, all the people watching that want to get started, whatever it is that I do, send a message, be effective, and I will, to the best of my ability, try to be a value for you to either help you, assist you, or guide you in the right direction. If I have people messaging me about wanting to get into real estate, I'm just like, well, I'm still learning. How about you message Steve and yeah. you know connect with him? Um, that is my biggest focus is uh, we're, we're so well connected now in the entrepreneurial space yeah, we are. where I never try to say that 
trading is the only way or the best way, not at all, right, to make mm -hmm. money. Uh, if I have people asking me about Forex, should I do Forex, should I do crypto, should I do stocks? You know, this is what I do. If you want to pursue the other markets, all power to you, these are the people that I would suggest, right? Yeah. And as long as you approach it with an open mind, you understand that there's risk to every opportunity in which you choose to take yeah, advantage right. of. But as long as you do it with the proper and right intention of enjoying what it is that you do, that you don't necessarily do it for the monetary aspect right away, um, I do have to say I do attribute a lot of my success to having that stability of that stable income because it allowed me to approach these different creative markets in a much more relaxed way, which provided me the luxury of time that allowed me to scale to the point of where it is that I am today. I pulled up working at Verizon Wireless as a 22 year old. Uh, I had a McLaren MP4 12C. This is before my course, before anything. Um, I had my YouTube channel, I traded, and I was working full-time at Verizon, actually part-time at Verizon, and I was a full-time student at a Corvette Z06 2015 that I bought and resold for $2,500 profit, and I bought a McLaren MP4-12C off of a student from ASU, and I did that with another YouTuber, and I sold that one for $15,000 profit. And I pulled up at my job, part-time, <laughs> youngest person to be working there, and I didn't care about how much money I made when I worked at that job. All I cared about was utilizing every moment of my day to be productive. And if I can do, you know, it, I didn't replace my job or quit my job until I could do something better with my time. Yeah, And that's, I think, what I would love to express through this podcast is if you actually want to do well in any market, put in the time, put in the effort, and don't be afraid to, you know, be creative to stand out, especially in today's very competitive, like entrepreneurial very market. Very competitive, very noisy market. Of course. Um, man, I wish, I wish I could see the people's faces when you pulled up in the McLaren. Um, so if someone wants to get a hold of you, send you a message, how do they do that? Just message me on Instagram. There's so many fake uh, Ricky Gutierrez Instagram accounts. I have one. I don't have, I don't trade Bitcoin. I don't trade crypto. I don't manage money for you. Nothing like that. I have one account. I have 187,000 followers on Instagram. You can message me there. And if you're not on Instagram, um, you can find me on YouTube. I have nearly 1 million followers. Uh, subscribers. And from there, you can connect to our free Facebook groups, our free Discord groups. Just know that we have so many free alternatives, just like in anything, right? There's so many free ways on how to get started. There's a thing called paper trading. Have you heard of it? Where it's fake money. It mm -hmm. allows you to practice. Yeah, so you learn uh, without losing money. Exactly. And with such accessible markets, I think it's the best thing anyone can do because it really allows you to focus on the important part and that's learning mm -hmm. as you're going to make mistakes. So if you're someone that really wants to get started, send me a message and I'd love to connect that way. Awesome. Thank you very much. Of course, man. Appreciate I appreciate it. you having me. Thank you. Thank you guys for watching.